Uh, good day and, and welcome to the fifth in the series of uh, STEAM lectures hosted by Project Solutions. Uh, Project Solutions are a, an engineering design and project management company. We've got offices in um, Yorkshire and Teesside. My name's Brian Lawson and as well as um, working for Project Solutions as the technical director, I'm also the chair of the Yorkshire region. Um, these lectures are supported by uh, a number of people. Uh, without them, they just wouldn't happen. Um, so I'd just like to uh, thank Nikki Baxter from the Yorkshire region, IMECI, who does all the hard work in the back office in preparation for this. And um, with this series of lectures, we've been uh, collaborating with colleagues in HQ in uh, Birdcage Walk. So thank you to Lucy Edmonds uh, and her team. Um, we've got Natalie Bradshaw supporting us uh, on the uh, WorkCast platform. Um, we've previously run these lectures for the Yorkshire region uh, and they proved really, really popular. Um, and that is absolutely due to the uh, the excellent support we get from Spyrax Sarko and the brilliant delivery uh, by Dan Wells. Um, and in, with this series, we've also got uh, Stephen Bishop, uh, one of Dan's colleagues. Um, Stephen will be helping to field questions. Um, you can ask the questions by using the uh, the question button uh, on the uh, webcast uh, screen. Just a couple of pieces of logistical information. Um, as I mentioned, questions can be asked uh, via the, the question button. Uh, the lectures will be recorded and then posted on the iMeki um, YouTube cha channel. And also just a, a shout out for anybody that is interested in uh, volunteering uh, with the iMeki. Uh, the majority of things that happen within the iMeki um, are done uh, with the help of volunteers uh, who were just normal members who really want to promote engineering, uh, especially uh, with regard to young people as well. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, get more involved, uh, you can track me down on LinkedIn um, or you'll be able to contact us via the, uh, the iMeki website. Okay, without uh, further ado, I shall hand over to Dan. Uh, it's all yours, buddy. Take it away. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction, Brian. I'd also like to thank uh, yourself and your colleagues at Projects and also iMeki, both regionally and nationally, for permitting us to present this series of presentations to you. So previously, um, we've delivered way back in March on the topic of STEAM system fundamentals, where we looked at the first principles with STEAM and also how we generated a good condition of STEAM. Moving forwards, we looked at the basic STEAM system design considerations that we need to observe in distributing STEAM from the point of generation to the point of use. We moved on to look at how we use STEAM for sources of heat exchange. The last time we met two weeks ago, we looked at using uh, um, STEAM traps to actually separate the useful heat energy in the STEAM to allow the condensate past the STEAM trap. And today we're going to look at a little bit more detail with regards to understanding what condensate is and the good working practice we need to employ to return that condensate from the process back to the energy center where it can be reused. So I've introduced Spyrax Sarco as a global entity previously. Spyrax Sarco is a UK FTSE 100 100 organization, but we've got a number of different officers and countless employees based all throughout the world that are always on hand to offer support, regardless of whether you may be designing a particular project in one part of the world for installation on site in a different part of the world. We're always on hand to offer that support. But um, as far as the UK and Ireland is concerned, we're a team that's approximately 200 strong. About 50% of us are home-based, and we also make a number of different resources available to support a variety of different engineering disciplines online. So that can be our online calculators, configurators, and tutorials. 
But we've also got a suite of very powerful calculators and configurators in the form of an app that can be downloaded to your Android phone, to your smartphone. And they're very, very useful, whether you be designing a steam distribution network to help you size the steam pipes and the condensate pipes, to help you calculate the capacity requirement of a steam trap or a control valve. But it can also help you to calculate the energy content present in a mass of steam and a mass of condensate, and also the cost of any steam that you may be generating or any steam that may be vented away to atmosphere and otherwise lost. So I would encourage you to download those little apps. Please make sure that you download the Spirax Arco Mexico version if you're going to do so. Uh, there's a lot more functionality on the Mexican version and there's also the provision to change the language back to, to British again. So on with today's presentation, as we've mentioned, it's the fifth of our series of CPD presentations on the topic of condensate. And for those of you that have attended the previous presentations we've gone through, hopefully, hopefully you'll appreciate that condensate is the byproduct of steam whenever it's used for heat exchange purposes or wherever there may be a heat loss in the distribution network. And as we go through the presentation today, it'll probably become clear why it's the condensate side of the loop, the wet side, that so often causes problems for so many mechanical engineers, especially those who may be more experienced with liquid-based systems, such as low temperature hot water. So today we're going to go through the presentation to fully understand what condensate actually is and how we need to treat it completely differently to water and to help us to both understand the problems it can bring to a process by, by not draining the condensate away and also the benefits it can bring if we can find a way to reuse the heat energy present within that condensate. So I'm going to show the slide that I've, uh, I've, I've shown on a number of occasions now and I'm, I make no apology for showing it again because it's perhaps the single most important slide that we ever go through. So what you'll remember is over towards the left hand side of the screen we're showing the steam tables and towards the right hand side of the screen we're showing the temperature enthalpy curve. So there's a lot of very very powerful information demonstrated in the steam tables. First of all we've got the pressure. Now that could be the pressure that the steam is being generated at in the boiler it could be the pressure of the steam in the distribution pipework, or it could be the pressure of the steam at the heat exchanger. And we also remember that steam has got a pressure to temperature relationship. In other words, if we know the pressure that the steam exists at, we know it's temperature. So if we're distributing steam at 10 bar gauge, that steam will have a temperature of 184 degrees. The next column, the enthalpy of water. We also refer to that as the sensible heat. That shows us how much energy we need to put into that water to bring it up to boiling point, at which point steam starts to be evaporated. So in the case of 10 bar gauge, you can see we need to put 782 kilojoules for every kilogram to bring that water up to boiling point. But we also remember that we don't want boiling water. We want steam to exist as a gas we need that boiling water to fully evaporate. So we need to put more energy into that boiling water. That's demonstrated in the next column. We can refer to that as the enthalpy of evaporation. We can also refer to it as the sensible heat. So when we've added, uh, sorry, the latent heat energy, when we've added the latent heat energy to the sensible heat energy, you can see that in the next column, that's what we refer to as the total heat, the heat that is present within that mass of steam. And the final column, well, that demonstrates the volume that that mass of steam will exist at if we know the pressure. So as you can see, at a higher pressure, we've really compressed that volume of steam down. So it occupies a much smaller volume. And that's one of the reasons why a high pressure steam can be distributed in a very small pipe diameter. So as you can see, if we manipulate the pressure of the steam, all of these values are changing. So that's one of the important reasons why we encourage you to download that useful little app that's demonstrated in the bottom left corner of the screen. 
But what we also need to remember is when steam gives up its heat energy, it condenses. So there's a change of state from a gas to a liquid. And as you can see, when steam gives up its heat energy and condenses, it's actually the enthalpy of evaporation. It's that latent heat. It's the energy that we added to the boiling water to make it change state. That's the energy that is used by the process. So in other words, that liquid condensate that is left behind, that retains the remaining sensible heat. So there's a lot of valuable information demonstrated here in the steam tables. It shows us the energy we need to put into the water to produce steam. It tells us how much energy we need to put into the water to bring it to boiling point. It tells us the pressure temperature and the pressure volume relationship. But it also tells us that if we understand the pressure that the condensate exists at, we know both the temperature and how much energy there is present within that condensate. And we also know by observing the temperature enthalpy curve, we appreciate that from time to time, depending upon how accurately and reliably we're operating the steam boiler, we are likely to get steam that is being produced in the wet steam zone. We won't be producing dry, saturated steam. And what you may recall from previous presentations in the series is that if we're distributing steam that is not perfectly dry, it's far more likely that that steam will condense out in the distributing pipework. In other words, we're going to have a massive condensate that needs to be removed from the infrastructure. It also means it's a representative of a, a distribution inefficiency because we're going to get less steam finding its way to the process than the boiler's actually producing. The problems we encounter by leaving that condensate there well, it means we need to install a greater number of steam traps to remove that condensate. It means if we don't, we're more susceptible to the erosion, the corrosion and the water hammer. But it also means that any dry steam will degrade as it passes across that trapped mass of condensate, meaning that not only do we get a reduced mass of steam finding its way to the process, but that the steam that does find its way to the process will have less energy contained within it. So wet steam is going to bring around a greater heat loss and more condensate that exists, not only at the process, but especially in the distribution pipework. So it's for that reason that everything we do with regards to steam generation and steam, steam distribution design should be with the aim of keeping the steam as dry as we possibly can. So when steam's being used to heat a process, we need to remember that it's that enthalpy of evaporation. It's that latent heat energy that we add to a process, to that boiling water. That's the energy that passes from the primary side of the heat exchanger to the secondary side. So we can only use this latent heat, this enthalpy of evaporation, and that's about 75% of the total heat energy present within the steam itself. So that means that the energy that's left behind, once that latent heat energy has entered the process, that's the sensible heat. That's demonstrated in the enthalpy of water, that first column on the steam tables. And that's about 25% of the total heat energy that's present within that mass of steam. So there's nowhere near enough energy present within the condensate to heat the process. We need to get it away. But the one area where we can use that energy in the condensate to good effect is by returning it or recovering it back to the boiler house again. So just to reiterate, if we put one litre or one kilogram of water into the boiler, it's going to change state and it's going to produce one kilogram of steam. And when that one kilogram of steam condenses, it's going to change state from a gas to a liquid but the mass will remain exactly the same. So that's why we always refer to steam distribution systems by mass flow rate, because a kilogram of steam will equal a kil kilogram of condensate. But what changes is the volume, and that volume is dictated by whatever pressure we're generating the steam boiler at, because that's going to determine the volume of the steam. And remember, with it being a compressible gas, 
a higher pressure steam distribution network will result in steam existing at a lower volume. So we've mentioned that condensate exists wherever we've got a heat loss, wherever the steam gives up its heat energy. And the steam's going to give up its heat energy in two different places. First of all, we've got the heat losses in the distribution network, which we don't want. And we've got the heat losses that uh, result in the steam giving up its heat energy at the process, which, of course, we do want. So if we look at the heat losses in the distribution pipe work, first of all, well, we typically work on a rule of thumb that says that approximately 2% of all of the steam that's being generated is going to result in condensate existing in the distribution pipe work. So, for example, if we're generating, say, 10,000 kilograms per hour of steam, we expect that approximately 200 kilograms per hour will change state and produce condensate in the distribution pipe work. And we remember there's far, far less energy in the condensate than there is in steam. And unless we're getting rid of that condensate, we're more susceptible to that erosion, corrosion, water hammer. We're more susceptible to steam with less energy contained within it. And we're certainly going to need to install, maintain and inspect a greater number of steam traps. The thing to bear in mind is that 2% rule of thumb, it only applies when the steam infrastructure is at a nice high temperature. So if we've got a steam network that is switched off periodically throughout the week, maybe during the weekend hours or during the evening, then for the first hour or maybe even two hours when the steam boiler is switched on, the steam is going to be slightly wet and it's going to be giving up more and more of its heat energy to heat the infrastructure, to heat the network. In other words, there's going to be a far, far greater condensate load at that point. So that 2% rule of thumb, it applies to what we refer to as the running load. But we always double that 2% to allow for that higher warming up load, 4%. Now, if we, hadn't, if we hadn't allowed for that warming up load, then the steam traps would be significantly undersized. And that's when we're at risk of that condensate backing up and slowly starting to flood the distribution network and when that happens of course we're going to see that erosion corrosion water hammer and we're likely to get steam finding its way to the process with significantly less energy contained within it because it's now wet steam and of course we're going to find the remainder of the steam is going to give up its heat energy at the process and as we've mentioned that's a good thing because that's where we want the steam to condense and give up its heat energy but just as we apply a warming up load for the steam traps on the distribution pipe work, it's good working practice to allow a similar warming up load at the process. Just as we find that there's going to be a greater heat loss when we're warming the system up from cold, the same applies with the heat exchanger itself. We're going to be putting more and more steam into that infrastructure and it won't necessarily be entering the process. So we're going to get more and more condensate being produced as the process is calling for more and more steam in those initial stages. Without us sizing the steam trap correctly to allow for the warming upload, we're at risk that we could have undersized the steam traps. So one thing that can have a significant impact on the amount of condensate that's produced in the distribution pipe work is insulation. We've mentioned we always distribute steam in uh, steel pipe work at high pressure. And especially if we've got wet steam or oversized pipe work, we expect that we can get a significant amount of heat loss. So we always use insulation, first and foremost, to protect against any health and safety incidents, but also to keep that heat loss to an absolute minimum. So one of those calculators and configurators that we have on our website will help you understand the beneficial effect we can have by increasing the grade of insulation. By doing so, reducing the heat losses, and by doing so, retaining as much steam in the distribution pipe work as we possibly can. And those calculators can give an indication with regards to the payback that you can enjoy in financial terms simply by increasing the grade of insulation. 
It could well be that we've got an excess of erosion, corrosion or water hammer in the distribution pipework. And maybe by increasing the grade of insulation that's present on the pipework, maybe we can reduce the condensate burden and have a positive effect on each of those things. So as we've mentioned already, steam, it gives up its enthalpy of evaporation. It gives up its useful latent heat energy by condensing, by changing state from a gas to a liquid. So you can see above what we'd refer to as a typical closed loop system. That's when steam goes onto a heat exchanger and that condensate that's full of the sensible heat because the steam's given up its useful latent heat energy, that condensate's got to be drained away because if we don't, it could back up and it could flood the process. And when that happens, then the rate of heat exchange is simply going to extend and extend. So it bears mentioning that steam it can be used in a number of direct injection processes, for example, humidification or if it's being used for injection directly into a, a, a vat of water, for example. And in those cases, the steam and also the condensate becomes consumed in the process. So for direct injection processes, there simply isn't going to be any condensate to recover anyway. So an example of a closed loop system, it could be a jacketed vessel, it could be a shell and tube heat exchanger, or it could be a plate heat exchanger. But the important thing to bear in mind is it's important that we keep that steam as dry as we possibly can. So I just want to come back to the steam table slides that we looked at earlier. We know that when steam gives up its latent heat energy, it condenses. We know that the condensate retains its sensible heat, which is around about 25% of the total heat energy. And we know that both the steam and the condensate enjoy that same pressure to temperature relationship. And that's really down to the fact that when steam condenses, it gives up its energy. So there's an exchange of energy, but there isn't an exchange of temperature. So just to clarify what we've gone through in previous weeks, if we're distributing steam at a nice high pressure, let's say 10 bar gauge, then the temperature of the steam at 10 bar gauge is going to be 184 degrees. In other words, the condensate that we're distribute the condensate that exists in that distribution pipework, it will also exist at the same temperature, 184 degrees. It can exist as a liquid because of that pressure. But if we've reduced the pressure of the steam to control the temperature, let's say, let's say we've got a process, a heat exchanger, that only requires the steam to exist at 134 degrees. Well, we can achieve that by reducing the pressure down to two bar gauge. But at that point, the condensate will also exist as a liquid at two bar gauge at 132 degrees. So it'll exist as a liquid at that point because of the pressure. But what we also know is the dryness of the steam is critically important. So the steam tables are based on the assumption that the steam is going to be 100% dry. And in practical terms, that is very, very rarely going to happen. But what we've also said at the opposite extreme is that if we're not controlling, generating or distributing the steam, observing good working practice, then that steam could be very wet. And if we know the dryness fraction of the steam, then we know how much energy or how much useful heat energy, how much enthalpy of evaporation is going to be present within that steam. So that means we could have a heat exchanger that is calling for more and more steam than is actually um, the heat exchanger may be designed for. It's got to provide more and more steam to the process because it needs more and more energy. So the wetter the steam, the more energy is going to be consumed by the heat exchanger to provide the required heating effect of the process. Now, the thing to bear in mind there is if we're condensing more and more steam at the heat exchanger, there's more condensate that needs to be discharged across the steam trap and into the condensate network. 
So a common question we come across is, uh, okay, our client is, um, they're aware of the benefits that that hot condensate can bring them. There's no value to the condensate at the process. There's certainly no benefit in keeping the condensate back in the distribution pipe work. We need to drain it away. And the one useful area where we can make use of that condensate is by getting it back to the energy center. There's very little energy in the condensate compared to steam, but there's a significant amount of energy compared to cold water straight from the mains. So it's in a fantastic condition for keeping the hot well or the feed tank at a nice high temperature. Hot water in the feed tank, it means that we get less stress and thermal shock placed on the boiler. It means we're producing steam more rapidly and more responsively. It means we're producing steam more efficiently from an energy perspective. And condensate has already been chemically conditioned. So it's in a perfect state for going back into the boiler again. So a client may say, yes, we're aware of the benefits of recovering condensate. But how much condensate am I actually recovering? How efficient is my steam system actually working? And the good news is that the vast majority of steam using sites will already be um, calculating how much condensate they're recovering, although they may be completely unaware of it. And that's because boiler guidance, BG01 and BG03, they oblige us to measure or monitor the water quality on a daily basis in three different areas of the energy center. So first of all, they're obliged to take um, a TDS reading. That's the total dissolved solids um, of the makeup water that's coming into the energy center. They're obliged to take a reading of the total dissolved solids of the condensate that's been returned from the plant and also the same reading of the water as it leaves the feed tank into the boiler. So we can simply take a ratio of each of those readings to determine a percentage. And that percentage will tell us how much condensate is actually coming back from the plant to the energy center. It gives us a very, very good understanding of how efficiently our steam boiler is working. So the next question is, well, what should I be aiming to recover? What does, look, what does good actually look like? And a typical rule of thumb is we should be aiming to recover somewhere between 60 to 80 percent of all of the steam that's been distributed as condensate. So, for example, if we're generating 10,000 kilograms per hour of steam, we want to be aiming to recover about 8,000 kilograms per hour of condensate. It's impossible to expect that we should be recovering 100 percent because, as we've already mentioned, some of those processes could be using steam for direct injection purposes, at which point there is no condensate to recover. And as we mentioned in the previous presentation, it's inevitable that we may have the occasional leaking steam trap. We may have the occasional uh, flash steam vent, both of which means that we're losing steam to atmosphere and therefore that condensate isn't available to be returned. But we need to be aware of what the benefits are of recovering as much condensate as we possibly can. And in the example that you can see, by increasing the rate, rate of condensate recovery from 80% to 60%, it means that we've reduced the amount of makeup water that we could be consuming by 50%. So that's a significant cost saving on water alone. And we also know that if we can recover more and more of that condensate at a nice high temperature, 85 degrees or, or above, well, if we observe a rule of thumb that says every six degrees we can increase the temperature of the feed tank by, it's going to result in approximately 1% in fuel savings, in energy savings. And we also know that that condensate is not only water, it's not only heat energy, but it's also been chemically conditioned already. So we've got a further saving with the chemical costs. So I want you to remember a rule of thumb here, and that's that we want to be aiming to recover ideally 80% of the condensate in 80% in of the steam that we're generating in the form of condensate. And we want to keep 
the temperature of the hot well at approximately 80 degrees, maybe even 85 degrees. So please remember that rule of thumb. That gives us an indication that we're going to have a well-designed steam distribution network and a healthy rate of condensate recovery. So in the last presentation we went through two weeks ago, we understand that it's the steam trap that really separates the steam distribution network from the condensate return network. And the steam trap is a passive device. In other words, we need a good steam pressure, both in the process and in the distribution pipe work, to push the condensate across the trap and to give the condensate enough motive energy to return back to the boil house. But it's important that we not only select the correct type of steam trap, that we size the steam trap correctly, but also it's vitally important that that steam trap is monitored periodically to ensure that it's operating in the correct condition. We remember that steam traps can fail in the open position and steam traps can fail in the closed position. So when a steam trap's failed in the closed position, the condensate is likely to back up and flood the process. Heat exchange simply will not occur. But it can also mean that the condensate can back up across a steam trap and start to flood the distribution pipework, at which point we're at risk of that erosion, corrosion, and water hammer that we spoke about. But of course, if a steam trap fails in the open position, then not only are we losing that valuable energy in the steam to atmosphere, we're simply missing the opportunity to recover that condensate for the simple reason it's going to waste. So it's vitally important that those steam traps are monitored periodically. So I also want to consider what condensate actually is. So let's take a typical steam using process here. And you can see the jacketed vessel on the screen. It's been designed to condense 100 kilograms per hour of steam at a pressure of seven bar gauge and at a temperature of seven bar gauge. So we know that when steam gives up its heat energy and condensers, we know that it changes state from gas to a liquid. We know there's a volumetric change, but we know there isn't a mass change. 100 kilograms of steam is 100 kilograms of condensate. We know that when steam condenses, it doesn't give up its temperature. In other words, the condensate that exists in the pipework that's been drained away from the bottom of the heat exchanger, we've got the same mass flow rate, we've got the same temperature, and we've got the same pressure. The only difference is it exists as a liquid rather than as a gas. So it's relatively easy to size the pipework at this point here we size it on water as a liquid. But the only thing to bear in mind is that just as it's good work in practice to size a steam trap on the distribution pipe work to allow for that higher warming upload, we want to apply the same rule of thumb when it comes to removing the condensate away from the process. So typically we allow a safety factor. We want to allow for approximately three times more condensate to be removed from the process. In other words, we'll multiply that 100 kilogram per hour running load to allow for a warming upload of say two, maybe even 300 kilograms per hour. If we hadn't done that, then that warming upload that was present when we were warming the system up from cold, it would result in the condensate backing up and starting to flood the process. And remember, Condensate's got significantly less heat energy contained within it than steam does. So that would result in a little bit of water hammer as the steam pressurized the condensate, but it would result in a significant slowdown in bringing the process up to the required temperature in the desired design conditions. So when we're looking at removing the condensate, that liquid upstream of the steam trap, we remember, yes, it's a liquid. Yes, it exists at a high temperature because of the pressure. But by referring back to the, um, the steam tables, we also understand that there's a significant amount of sensible heat present in that high temperature, high pressure condensate. But because it's under pressure, it is a single phase liquid. 
In other words, we can size the pipework at this point here by simply refer referring to traditional or typical water pipe sizing charts. And of course, we can download those off the internet um, or we can use that very, very useful little app that we've spoken about. The important thing is allowing for that warming upload. So here we've got an example of where we've tripled that 100 kilogram per hour condensate load to allow for the warming upload. We've taken the red line horizontally across and that's helped us to size the appropriate condensate pipework. Now the problem that we have that catches out so many engineers and the vast majority of problems that we encounter on a condensate distribution system is trying to understand what actually happens when that condensate falls in pressure across the steam trap. Remember, we need that fall in pressure because we need to allow for the motive energy in the steam to push the condensate across the trap and energize it so it can travel back to the boiler house where it can be reused. The thing to bear in mind is if we've got high pressure, high temperature steam, with that high amount of sensible heat energy contained within it, upstream of the steam trap, when we get that fall in pressure downstream of the steam trap, well, we know that the fall in pressure means the condensate's got to fall in temperature and it's got to give up some sensible heat. So the only way that's, that condensate can give up that sensible heat is by some of that heat energy moving from sensible heat back to total heat. So a certain mass or a certain percentage of that condensate, it's going to change state from a liquid back to steam again. We refer to that as flash steam. The problem we have with flash steam is, well, well first and foremost, it's, um, it's a gas. So it's going to exist at a far, far greater volume than the condensate does as a liquid. And what you may recall from previous presentations is a kilogram of condensate, it's got a volume of 0 0.001 cubic meters when it exists at zero bar gauge. But a kilogram of steam at the same pressure is going to exist at a volume that's about 1,673 times greater. So of course, we've got to size the downstream pipe work to allow for that huge increase in volume. If we don't do that, then that huge increase in volume is going to place a huge back pressure on the steam trap itself. And that's going to hold back the condensate and start to flood the process. It means that huge expansion is going to energize the condensate in the pipework very, very quickly. It's going to push that condensate with a lot of energy, creating water hammer and violence. And ultimately, the flash steam is going to be vented away to atmosphere at the nearest vent or it may travel all the way back to the boiler house and cause the feed water to um, have a, an over temperature. So we always size the pipework downstream of the steam trap, allowing for that pressure drop, which is going to result in that phase change. So please always consider condensate as a biphase, unless we know for certain it exists at a stable pressure. So here you can see, Good work in practice with regards to how we size a condensate pipework to allow for that biphase, that rapid expansion. So at the bottom part of the graph, we've got the pressure drop, seven bar gauge running across to atmospheric. On the top part, we've got the mass flow rate, 100 kilograms per hour. So we take the dotted line and we run the line up diagonally, and you can see how we would correctly size a condensate pipe work at the appropriate mass flow rate, allowing for the pressure drop. Somewhere between 20 and 25 milli uh, millimeters, depending upon whether the pipe size is climbing away from the steam trap or falling. Now, what you can see is if we'd mistakenly assumed that condensate was a liquid and that there wasn't a phase change, we'd have just taken the horizontal line straight across and of course that pipe work would be massively undersized that's where we encounter the vast majority of problems so it is acceptable to bring multiple condensate lines uh, together from multiple processes the only thing we need to bear in mind is that 
processes can be discharging condensate at different mass flow rates, different pressures, different temperatures. So where those lines converge, they need to step up accordingly to allow for the appropriate mass and volume of the liquid condensate, but also of the volume of flash steam as a result of any phase change they may be. Don't get confused by this little formula that's demonstrated at the bottom of the screen because, of course, you can use those calculators and configurators to help you do that. So we've mentioned that a steam trap is a passive device. We do need a good motive energy in the steam to push that condensate away. So, of course, we know that in a certain number of processes, it may well be that we only require a very small amount of energy in that steam to add a small amount of energy to a process. So the example we've got here is an air handling unit. Now, it could apply to any other heat exchanger. I'm just using this as an example. Let's say we were using a steam coil to heat air coming from outside a building uh, to, to heat a, a, a production line or to heat an office space. If it was a very warm day outside, let's say 25 degrees outside, sorry, 20 degrees outside, but let's say we just needed to top the temperature of the air up to 25 degrees, we'd only need to add a very, very small amount of energy. That means that we only need the steam to exist at a low temperature. Because of that pressure temperature relationship, it means that that steam could exist in these coils at very, very close to atmospheric pressure. And if we've got a huge back pressure on the condensate infrastructure, that could mean that there is insufficient pressure in the steam to push the condensate out of the heating coils across the steam trap and energize it so it can travel back to the boiler house. So on an occasion such as this, well, the condensate will back up and start to flood the heat exchanger. And because there's less energy present in the condensate than there is in steam, we're not going to be able to get the energy into the duct or into the process. The sensors in the duct work would send a signal to the control valve calling for more and more energy. The control valve would open wider and wider. As the control valve opens wider, that increased steam pressure pressurizes the condensate. The condensate is driven out of the coils with quite a lot of violence across the steam trap with quite a lot of violence. We get a huge fall in pressure, creating quite a lot of that flash steam that we've spoken about. So we get the flash steam vented away to atmosphere. We get a rapid release of energy, creating water hammer. Could create a little bit of damage to the steam trap itself, a little bit of back pressure on the steam trap little bit of damage to the steam coils, coils. We get the control valve constantly fighting itself. We refer to that as hunting because it's going to open wider and wider and then close very quickly in a short period of time. But ultimately, we're going to get a failure of the heat exchanger and we get a very erratic release of heat energy into the process. Something that we refer to as stall and something that is very, very common in heat exchangers using steam, especially if they can be using steam at relatively low pressures and temperatures for a certain, uh, certain period. The good news is we can calculate when stall is likely to occur and we can also protect against stall from occurring. So when we've got the steam that exists at a nice high temperature and nice high pressure with enough motive energy in the steam, so that condensate can be managed by passing it away across a typical float trap. But we can also use an automatic pump trap. And basically that means that when there is a good motive steam energy, then it will operate in exactly the same way as a float trap. But when we don't have any steam pressure available, we can simply call for a very, very small mass of high pressure steam. And that exists just before the steam is reduced in pressure across the pressure reducing valve or control valve. So by lending that high pressure motive steam, it enables us to shunt the condensate away from the process. So two benefits really, we're enabling the 
heat energy to pass across the heat exchanger very, very quickly without the risk of stall occurring. And we're able to get that condensate back to the boiler house where that high heat content can be used quickly and efficiently. But of course, we know that there are always going to be occasions where we need to add a significant amount of energy or a significant amount of motive energy to a large mass of condensate. For example, if we're moving condensate from the very, very far part of a, a large site. And we can do that in a number of different ways. We can use an electric condensate recovery pump. As the name suggests, it does require electrical installation because we will have um, centrifugal pumps either on off or modulating that sit underneath the condensate receiver. So the thing to bear in mind here is because we require electrical installation and because the pumps work electrically, it's important that we size the receiver to allow for that liquid condensate to fall to somewhere around 97 degrees atmospheric condition for two reasons. One, we can only pump a liquid. We can't pump a biphase. And two, we can't pump a liquid if it's at a temperature any higher than 100 degrees. Because if that were to happen, that rapid phase change and that flash steam as we saw fall in pressure and temperature, it would result in that pump cavitating and failing. And those pumps would be quite costly to replace. And until such a time that we could replace those pumps, that valuable hot condensate would back up and it would be discharged to waste across an overflow. So if we were working in the, boilers, in the boiler house and we saw that temperature gauge hanging at significantly less than 80 degrees, we could run the calculation to determine how much condensate was coming back to the boiler house. And then we, the first thing we should do is visit the plant room where one of these receivers was located to identify where that condensate was actually going. Typically, it would be as a result of the, the centrifugal pumps failing. So it's important that we also size the flash steam vent correctly because we need to vent that energy to atmosphere partly to allow that, um, uh, that energy to be dissipated so we're not causing cavitation of the pumps. But another key benefit is once that flash steam has been vented away, the condensate will now exist as a single phase liquid. So we can now pump that condensate back to the energy center in a much, much smaller pipe diameter because we're pumping a liquid here. Now, a common problem that we also encounter with uh, condensate recovery pumps is, well, imagine if we've got um, very, very wet steam being delivered to a heat exchanger, and therefore we're condensing more and more steam than we expected. Well, by nature, we'd have more condensate to recover. It may well be that the original condensate receiver is undersized. It may well be that we've added a new heat exchanger into the plant room without giving thought to the additional burden of condensate that the pump would need to encounter. It would simply mean that that condensate could now no longer cool down in enough time. The pumps would be at risk of cavitating and they could back up and that condensate would be dumped to waste. Maybe we've got a failed steam trap. If we've got one or more failed steam traps, we will be bringing plant steam into the condensate receiver. And of course, we run the risk then that we're never able to cool the condensate down sufficiently before it's passed across those pumps. So please give thought to ensuring that that receiver is sized as is the vent sized correctly. And similarly, it's not good working practice to lag the receiver as we need to ensure that the condensate cools down slightly before it is taken away across the pumps. And of course, we can also use a mechanical condensate recovery pump. It's essentially the big brother of that automatic pump trap. We're using the motive energy in the steam to pressurize the liquid condensate and shunt the condensate back mechanically. We don't need any electrical installation. And because of that, we're not at risk of any pumps cavitating or failing. But the thing to bear in mind is this pump, um, it will cycle. So it'll generally discharge um, four or five times an hour, maybe. Meaning that we do need to size the downstream condensate pipework on the discharge rate of the pump and not on the filling rate of the pump. 
So that means that this pipe work here could be sized three, maybe even four times bigger than the condensate filling pipe work. So if you're comparing the infrastructure from an electrical to a mechanical pump, could well be that the infrastructure is going to be more expensive for a mechanical pump because of that greater pipe diameter that's required. So it's important to give thought to not only recovering as much of that liquid condensate as we possibly can, but also minimizing that flash steam that's vented to atmosphere. And we can minimize that flash steam that's vented away by allowing the condensate to, to, to subcool slightly. And that's going to result in a, a lesser volume of flash steam being vented away. But even when we do need to vent that flash steam away to protect um, capital equipment, such as an electric condensate receiver, by passing it across um, an exhaust vent condenser, it means that we can at least increase the mass of condensate that can be recovered and returned back to the boiler house. And the calculations are relatively easy to undertake. If we know the pressures, temperatures and mass flow rates uh, that we're faced with, combined with the cost of steam generation for our application. And that information can be very, very useful for helping us to drive a project forward to keep the rate of condensate recovery at its highest and most attractive point. So I want to run a very quick cost saving um, example for you here. I want to start off by looking at the cost of steam that we have. So. If we use an example where we know that gas costs, say, three pence per kilowatt hour, and if we know the boiler's badged with an efficiency of 85%, if the steam boiler pressure is 10 bar gauge, and if the temperature of the feed tank or the hot well is 85 degrees, well, we might mistakenly assume that because the temperature of the hot well is 85 degrees, we might assume that that means that we've got an excellent rate of condensate return. And we may never have actually thought about measuring the amount of condensate that's coming back into the boiler house. And it could well be that the temperature of the hot well is held at that high temperature artificially. For example, by using a direct steam injection system to take steam straight from the boiler to add it to the hot well. We've got high temperature hot water but we don't necessarily have an efficiently operating condensate recovery system. Um, so, of course, it means that we're consuming more and more steam and also we've got more and more hot water going to waste as a result of that missing condensate. So we can calculate the cost of the steam by, first of all, taking the energy that's present within the steam at the known pressure, 10 bar gauge, for example, and we minus the energy that is present within the water at 85 degrees. And if we then multiply that by the overall efficiency of the boiler, so by multiplying it by 0.85, we're then able to determine how much gas we then need to consume to, to raise the steam. And we then multiply that by the cost of the gas. And you can see that that gives us a cost of steam of £23.81 per tonne. But remember, if we're using that direct steam injection to keep the boiler feed water temperature at 85 degrees, that could be due to the fact that we've got a lot of condensate being dumped to waste that we're not aware of. In other words, we're consuming more steam than we actually think we are. So let's say we've walked around the distribution network and we've identified that we've got a failed condensate pump or we could have a steam trap that's failed in the open position. If we're able to calculate how much condensate we can now recover, we know how much condensate we can get back to the feed tank. So that means that we're not only increasing the rate of condensate return, but we're also reducing the amount of direct steam injection that we were previously using. So let's say if we can get that condensate back to the boiler house at, um, let's say, 75 degrees, and we want to keep the hot well at a temperature of 85, it means that we need to put far, far less energy into the feed water by returning as much condensate as we could, say, compared to using raw water from the mains 
and then using direct steam injection to top up the temperature. So on this occasion, you can see that we'd be saving approximately 59 kilograms of steam per hour. And that doesn't sound like a great deal, but over the course of a year, that means that we'd be saving just over 12,000 pounds sterling per year, simply by increasing the rate of condensate return by 500 kilogram per hour. But that's scalable. So if we doubled the amount of condensate we can recover, well, the cost savings would double as well. But that's just that's just the energy savings. So that twelve thousand two hundred and twenty one pounds sterling per year, we can double that because we'd also be saving on the amount of raw water and also the chemical cost savings. Typically, we can double that. So that £12,000 sterling, it comes somewhere close to £25,000 sterling per year in cost savings. But please remember, they're scalable. So other ways that we can increase on the rate of condensate return is by using a pressurized deaerator. We'll come on, we'll talk about the PDA in a little bit more detail in future weeks. But by keeping the hot well under pressure, let's say 0.2 bar gauge, it means we can elevate the temperature of the feed water beyond 85 degrees. And that can't really be improved on with traditional vented systems uh, because of the risk of cavitation. But if we've got that hot water under pressure, it means we can contain more and more of those flash steam losses. And it means that we can uh, really start to quantify the benefits that we can uh, bring to a well-designed steam distribution network. But we also know that contamin uh, condensate is often dumped to waste through fear of contamination. The good news is that we can identify that con uh, contamination uh, before it is brought back to the boiler house. We can dump it to waste if it is contaminated, but it means that we can help to increase the rate of uh, uh, condensate return as much as is feasibly possible. So I just want to leave you by going back to a solution that we've looked at previously, and that's the boiler house energy monitor. And this really helps us to understand the mass and energy balance between taking a reading from the water coming into the building, the fuel coming to the boiler, the feed water leaving the hot well, and the steam that's leaving the boiler. Because by taking a mass and energy balance of all of these readings, it can determine when we're at a point when condensate is going missing. And when that is brought to our attention, we can walk the plant and we can identify why that is. Typically, it's going to be down to failed steam traps, down to an excess of flash steam that's vented away, or down to condensate pumps that aren't operating efficiently. So just to summarize, um, the mass of steam is going to equal the mass of condensate. We want to remember that condensate is a biphase, um, especially when we've got a pressure drop. And that biphase is going to result in flash steam that is typically vented away to protect a process from expansion or to protect pumps from cavitation. We don't have to lose the energy in that flash steam. We can recover it by passing it across a simple heat exchanger or by condensing it to keep the amount of condensate we can recover to the maximum point. Remember that rule of thumb, 85 degrees, 85% of the condensate. That's a target we should be aiming for. And that will give us an indication when we've got um, a condensate recovery system that is working efficiently. Remember, there's a significant amount of energy present within the condensate. But if we want to calculate the financial benefits of recovering condensate, we need to remember that it comprises of the heat, the water, the chemicals, and in certain cases, even the, uh, the effluent costs if that condensate were to be dumped to waste. So thank you very much for spending the time with us on today's presentation. We meet again in two weeks time, at which point we'll be discussing steam condition and steam quality. That's going to be pertinent to those of you that are in the high end processes such as food, beverage, pharmaceutical, farm, fine chemicals. But on that point, I'd like to thank you for your time. And if you do have any questions that we can address at this point, uh, please feel free to put them into the chat function. Um, Steve, can I, uh, Steve and Brian, can I ask if there are any questions that need any further uh, attention? 
Yeah, hi, Dan. Thank you very much for uh, another excellent uh, presentation there. Very, very informative. Um, and we do have uh, we do have a couple of questions, actually. Um, if I could just uh, read those out to you for uh, for an answer, if that's OK. Certainly. Um, so we've got uh, a question from Martin, uh, which relates back to uh, the piece where you were talking about condensate recovery units. Um, and he's asking what techniques are available to recover energy from the flash steam, which discharges to atmosphere from a condensate receiver. So in other words, can we recover any of that flash energy instead of discharging it, I guess? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it really depends upon the mass flow rates and the pressure drop. If we know the pressure drop, then we know the percentage of flash steam that will be produced. And if we know the, if we know the mass flow rate, then the calculation is an easy one. And then we can determine whether there's enough energy and enough mass flow rate in that flash steam to add value to maybe preheat another process locally. If there isn't, if we're just talking about a relatively small mass or relatively small amount of energy, we can run it across an exhaust vent condenser. And basically that recovers as much of the energy in that flash steam as we possibly can to help us top the receiver up with a little bit more of that high temperature condensate before it's vented to atmosphere. Okay, lovely. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dan. And hopefully that's uh, answered Martin's question. I'm sure he'll, uh, he'll let us know if that's not the case. Uh, and just one more question, which was uh, around uh, steam trap monitoring. And this is, uh, you showed automated steam trap monitoring on one slide. When would you use this instead of relying on a manual survey? Um, it could be um, a number of critical processes. For example, if you're in a process that um, the steam trap is located in a very, very difficult, hard to reach area, maybe in an undercroft or health and safety concerns, for example, you're able to take a reading wirelessly and remotely, safely. Could well be a critical process where there's a significant mass of energy that could be lost in a relatively short period of time and where the payback could be extreme. It could well be a process that is um, at danger of spoilage if a steam trap were to fail in the closed position. The good thing about automatic monitoring is they can give you the indication of the overall health of an individual steam trap not just at the fully open or fully closed position, but anywhere in between. So you can, you can get a very, very useful heads up for when a steam trap is on the point of starting to fail. And then you can schedule routine maintenance at a point when it is convenient for you. It's also very useful for giving energy managers a very, very accurate and reliable understanding of the overall efficiency of their steam distribution network. Okay, so you can plan that in instead of reacting to failures then, basically. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah Absolutely. very good. Excellent. Okay, that's uh, that's all the questions. Lovely. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. And if there are any further questions at any point in the future, then please don't hesitate to reach out to me on email or engage with me on LinkedIn. Failing that, uh, we look forward to speaking to you again in two weeks' time. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, great job again. Uh, usual high quality. Uh, we've just overrun by a couple of minutes, so I'll keep this really brief. A uh, big thank you to Spyrax Sarko, Dan and Stephen. Uh, thanks to the IMAC E team, Nikki and Natalie. Um, and also thanks to Project Solutions for supporting me uh, organising these lectures. So thanks very much. And as Dan said, we'll see you in two weeks' time. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.